Steve. It's truly an honor to have you here. Of all the things we grapple with most as museum professionals, I think, uh, and certainly something that always presents one of our biggest challenges, is not so much that we're almost always familiar with the topic that we present, uh, but really, uh, rather, how do we present it? How do we really reach people? For many years, I was a curator before I became a uh, bad and got into administration and fundraising. Hey. <laughs> and I was always most torn um, in taking the knowledge and excitement I had about the topic and making someone else equally as excited about it. That's not easy. Uh, because as much as we think we know and want to impart to others, we have to understand that chances are people are going to be exposed to what you have to say for the very first time. The good news, though, is that museums have more potential to do this efficiently and effectively, I think, than other traditional learning venues such as classrooms or books or photographs or films because we have the opportunity to directly engage our visitors in the learning process. This is especially true for science. And in this area, Dr. Paul wrote a book. Actually, he's written dozens of books and articles, too, on the subject of free choice learning, which focuses specifically on learning that occurs when visiting museums, zoos, aquariums, or parks. In short, everything that we're trying to do. A member of the faculty of Oregon State University, Dr. Paul founded and directed the Institute for Learning Innovation, where for 20 years he oversaw more than 200 research and evaluation projects involving a wide range of free choice learning institutions he also worked as an early childhood science educator at the University of Maryland and spent 14 years at the Smithsonian Institution where he held a number of senior positions, including director of the Smithsonian Office of Educational Research. In 2006, Dr. Falk was recognized by the American Association of Museums as one of the 100 most influential museum professionals of the past 100 years. In 2010, he was further recognized by the American Association of Museums Education Committee with its highest award, the John Cotton Dano Award for Leadership. And just last year, the U.S. Council of Science Society presidents gave Dr. Falk their Educational Research Award for his outstanding achievement in research that improved children's learning and understanding. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor to welcome Dr. John Falk. Okay, so thank you, Sandy. Thank you, Charlie. It's truly, can everybody hear me back there in the peanut gallery back there? Cheap seats. Um, <laughs> It truly is a pleasure to be here. It's, uh, I just always feel honored that folks are coming from such far distances to hear me speak back right now. Hopefully it'll be a rewarding experience. Um, and actually, I'm going to primarily talk today, um, I'm gonna talk about science, and I'm gonna talk about informal education, and I'm gonna talk about free choice learning. But as I do it, um, Bear in mind, I know that many of you come from other kinds of institutions. Um, and as Sandy said in my introduction, I, I, for better or for worse, I, I work in a lot of different areas. I mean, I work in the area of science education. I work in the area of informal education. I work with museums, but I also work with zoos and aquariums. I work in science institutions, but I've spent a lot of my years working with art and history museums and other cultural institutions as well. And over the last um, dozen or so years, I've, I've done a lot of work in ecotourism as well. Um, and actually, um, I have two doctors, but one, one is in ecology, so I bring that perspective as well as education. So I, 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 
I like to try and think broadly about the world, and I'm going to share that perspective with you today. Um, but again, uh, as, as a setup, just every time I use the word science, you know, you can fill in the blanks yourself if that doesn't apply. So here's what I'm going to try and talk about. And I'm going to spend, you know, we've got almost two hours together. We have two hours together today. I'm going to spend the first half talking at you, hopefully with you. Um, and then the last hour will open up just for discussion, question and answer. Um, as I said um, at dinner last night, you know, actually it's a rare and unusual experience that I get to speak for an hour. Because often I, you know, people invite me in and they give me 15 minutes and I got a lot to say. So, <laughs> so even, even an hour is, is putting a lot of stuff together. So hopefully it'll be an engaging hour. But, you know, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to sort of cover a lot of waterfront. Um, particularly quickly, sort of when, why, where um, do people learn? And then I'm going to focus specifically on this big question, well, that's great, people learn all the time in all these places, but what about this stuff that we do, this informal community? Is there any actual evidence that anybody really learns anything um, in these settings? And that's another one of those words. I'm going to use the word learning, but please know that when I use the word learning, I define it very, very broadly. It's not just facts and concepts, although that's part of it. <coughs> Um, it's also interest and engagement and behaviors and beliefs, all those things we learn. And so it's appropriate to use the term learning for that. Um, and then um, I'm going to try and at least give you some brief sense of what I personally and my colleagues at this point at Oregon State University, the University of Colorado, and George Mason University, who are all involved in this one project, how we have tried to take the understandings that come from this setup here um, to try and do something within a single community in Oregon to um, not just talk the talk but walk the walk. So, uh, here we go. Okay, so big question. When do people learn science? You know, the short answer is all the time, right? So, um, learn every day, every day of the week, throughout our lifetime. Um, little known fact, but you know we spend less than three percent of our life in any kind of formal instruction. Uh, even school-age kids spend less than twenty percent of their waking hours in a classroom, and that's you know in school. And that doesn't even necessarily mean they're in a classroom. Um, but we live in interesting times, to say the least. And one of the things that makes this interesting times is that historically, through most of um, you know, sort of the last 10,000 years at least, uh, where people have been living in cities, there have been gatekeepers to knowledge. And certainly over the last couple hundred years, those gatekeepers have been places like governments, schools, libraries. Um, and that's just no longer true. Um, there's lots of access to knowledge. Um, in fact, there's so much information out there, it's actually knowing how to sort through it. But as a consequence, uh, the boundaries of where and when and why and the whom one learns are eroding. And so the traditional boundaries between um, work, leisure, schooling, all that stuff is blurring. As a consequence, learning truly is continuous and cumulative. To be honest, it always has been. Um, but people are more deeply aware of it now than ever before. Because we live in a time of rapidly changing knowledge and understandings so even if you did pay attention in school, which most people don't, um, what you learned in school may or may not be relevant to you 10 years later. So um, if we can imagine a life space of 70 plus years, and you're awake from 7 in the morning to 11 at night, for example, 12 months out of the year, you know, you go to school for part of that time. And if you're lucky, you go to college. But there's an awful lot of space in there. And this is the space that we generally talk about as informal or free choice learning. Although I, when I, we didn't coin, and Derek and I didn't coin the term free choice learning, but when we championed that term, part of the reason we picked that term as opposed to informal, which was current at the time, still is, is that learning is not about where you are, it's about what you're doing and why you're doing. And so we wanted to put the emphasis more on the motivation 
of individuals. So in theory, schooling can be, and is, for choice learning for those who get choice and control over their learning. And when you're in a place like a museum, more often than not, it is free choice learning, but it doesn't have to be. If you force somebody to sit in the lecture room and give them a lecture and then to send them back to school, that's probably not free choice learning. <laughs> so why do people learn science? Well, the, the reality is they learn science anything, for lots and lots of reasons. First and foremost, people learn because they have interests and needs. That's what dictates what most people learn most of the time. Um, but we learn for lots of other reasons, too. You know, most of us work, most adults work, and they learn all kinds of stuff in order to meet the needs of their jobs. Um, people learn because they have hobbies. People learn to support the needs of others, particularly parents, often. Um, maybe learning things that they didn't know they wanted to learn, but their kids are interested in, so they, there they go. Um, we have a real often need to learn because of some issue that is in our lives. Um, most people in this room probably um, you know, pick a disease, don't know much about that disease, but should your significant other or you get that disease, all of a sudden you become quite knowledgeable in that disease. Um, is it a matter of science literacy that you should know about that disease? No. What is science literacy is that should you need to know, you're capable and take the time to learn about it. And then, of course, we also learn because we are told we have to learn in school and prepare ourselves for careers. We do a lot of that thing. And by the way, even though I'm a great advocate for this thing called free choice learning, there is a place and importance for compulsory learning. Um, you know, for example, talking about medicine, I, I'm really thrilled that my doctor has to, has to you know, go to medical school and pass a board exam. I think that's a good thing. Um, I think it's great that we get a driver's license pass the driving test. You know, those are compulsory learning <coughs> opportunities, and there is a, truly is a time and a place for people to have to show competency in specific things um, that they don't define competency for. But those are the exceptions, so they are not the rule in life. Most of us spend most of our life learning things that meet our own needs, and we have our own criteria for whether we are sufficiently knowledgeable in those or not. So, uh, I did a little sort of um, uh, grassroots study, sort of um, a crowdsource study where I tried to ask people um, to fill in a little survey, uh, get their friends and neighbors to fill in surveys, to ask them, tell me something, so, tell me an area of science or technology you know something about. And so this is the results of several hundred people who talked about the things that they know something about, right? And as you can see, a uh, lot gardening, biology, health, cooking, but you know, in, in their uh, there were given things like physics and you know school subject types of things, uh, astronomy, anatomy, but uh, a couple hundred people, <coughs> hundreds of different domains that people say they know something about in the realm of science and technology. So that's great. So where do people learn all this stuff? Um, well, you know, if if you think about learners, there's lots of ways that you can learn. So um, uh, people learn a lot from television shows. <laughs> um, so this is a uh, picture of Mythbusters. Um, people go to places like science museums and science centers. Um, they read books. Um, uh, we learn on the job. Um, we, read, we learn from magazines. We learn um, increasingly kids from gaming situations. Um, hobbies, not hobbies, but vacations. Um, leisure time activities, we get out in the world, um, we learn an awful lot, which isn't often appreciated for friends and family. Uh, uh, we do learn in school. Uh, we learn from after school programs, as at 4 um, increasingly from the internet, and then through hobbies. But if we try to quantify that, which I have done over many years, but this represents a whole series of random Surveys, and I'm going to talk more about that random survey. This is all from Los Angeles, data from Los Angeles. Um, and um, obviously, people could report that they self report that they used multiple resources to learn about stuff. Um, so, the takeaway message from this is people use a lot of resources in order to get the science knowledge they need and use on a daily basis. There are a couple of really interesting things. Since I started this 
data collection in 1997. Um, uh, the internet in 1997, 3% of the public said that they used the internet to work out um, science, technology, that increased to 10% in 2000, 24% in 2007, 67% by 2009. It's probably starting to plateau, but this is a significant exponential. So this number hasn't changed, basically, over a decade. But this number obviously has changed. So two numbers that really change. Um, the museum number hasn't changed appreciably. None of these, the only two numbers that have changed appreciably is this has grown up exponentially, and this has been linearly dropping. So whereas um, in 97, about 50% of the public said they got knowledge from school courses. Uh, by 2009, it's about a quarter of the public. And we can predict that that number will keep dropping too. So big changes going on in the world. Um, and if we just sort of summarize these in terms of looking at it as formal and informal and work related, what we can see is that at least on average, um, about 20% of the learning that people are getting is coming from school, about 20% of the workforce, and about two thirds is coming from these other places, places that most of us work in at the moment. Um, actually, you know, talking about science education, sort of a back in the envelope um, little thought experiment I did. I was really curious, you know, we talk about science educators. So but typically when politicians uh, and policymakers talk about science educators, they're talking about school teachers. Um, so I figured, well, how many informal, out of school, professional science educators are there? And my back of the envelope estimation came up with over a million in the U.S. In fact, there are almost twice as many uh, professional science educators working outside of school as in school. Um, but that's a little known fact. But that's all well and good. You know, uh, as people are wanting to say, well, that's great. We know that these out of school places are, are wonderful. Uh, they're really nice. But are they a necessity? Do the, you know, how much science learning, real science learning, really happens in these places? You know, they're fun. Everybody enjoys them, and they're probably good for generating interest, but are they really important contributors to the community? So I've been on a mission for the past um, 10 to 20 years to try and see if we can generate some evidence in support of the fact that, uh, yeah, they probably do make a difference. So let's look at some of that data. <coughs> so we'll start specifically with science centers and museums. Um, I actually have been collecting data, as I alluded, in Los Angeles for um, almost 20 years now, longitudinally, looking at the impact of that one institution, the California Science Center. I'm not going to share that data with you at the moment because I just completed another study, which I think actually um, in some ways is more powerful. And this was a study done um, building off the work that we did at the California Science Center. Um, I was approached by actually the director of a, the Science Center at that time in Finland, um, the institution's Hedeka, and the director was Hedda Helsen. Um, who actually is a very interesting dude, who was formerly head of the um, directive, um, the equivalent of the American Association of Science, but the Finnish version of that. He's a very distinguished scientist. But he took over um, the Science Center in Finland. He was really impressed when he saw me report on results in LA and said, you know, my colleagues and I are always complaining that we don't have enough data, and yet we still sit on our hands and wait for data to be collected. If we generated money, could you do this study internationally? I said, of course. Um, so between the two of us, and actually also um, Leslie Lewis in Canada, we ended up getting 17 science centers from 13 countries around the world to actually put their own money on the table to pay me and my colleagues to do a international science center impact study. And so that's, those are the results that I'm going to talk about. The final report. Um, it's not the final word on the data, but the final report um, was just finished a couple months ago. Um, and what we were trying to do was empirically determine um, whether a science center experience actually affects a whole range of significant outcomes 
in terms of public understanding of science, interest, curiosity. Um, do people who participate in science center experiences, do they have more science hobbies? Are they more likely to be engaged in science careers? Those are the kinds of things, kinds of outcomes we'd like to believe that we make a difference. So let's see if we can do that. And we specifically looked at um, two samples, uh, a youth sample, 14 and 15 year olds, and adults over the age of 18. Um, there's reasons for all those which I can go into, but I'm not right now. And I just feel compelled to give you, um, to digress and become along slightly more than I already am, um, to talk a little bit about methodology. Um, you know, there are a lot of folks, particularly in the U.S., there were, um, and, and you will see, there are 17 institutions from 13 countries. There's only one U.S. institution that was willing to put $20,000 on the table because they all plead, plead poverty. <laughs> and these are many very large institutions with $20 million a year budgets, by the way. Um, and uh, there's another little site that we gave them, that, which I'll, if time permits, I can go into. It was quite a scene at the last Aztec meeting where my um, international colleagues just berated the audience who was mostly Americans saying, you know, where the hell were you? you know, why, why didn't you participate in this? What's your problem? Anyway, um, but um, sort of these randomized control treatment designs are sort of what are considered the gold standard. You know, that's how you prove causality. And I very strongly said we cannot do a randomized controlled study of a science center experience. It's a free choice environment. What are we going to do? Randomly say, okay, this half of the room will only look at this. This half of the room will only look at that or won't go, right? And that's going to be valid. I mean, people go, they choose what they want to look at, they invest their time and their energy. What makes these places special is people get to choose, they get to choose with their feet and their minds what they want to pay attention to and why. And the reason they do that is they actually are disproportionately focused on things that they're interested in. And so they find these places very compelling because it satisfies their own needs and interests, unlike compulsory education. So we can't do a randomized control study. So I did use an epidemiological study, and I'll talk more about some of the implications of that down the road. But what that means is using that other medical model, um, which basically says if we want to understand something complex, like, for example, heart disease, um, it's not as if we can just say, well, you know, uh, heart disease has a single cause act, causality. Um, actually, it's because of epidemiological research, we know that exercise is important, genetics is important, diet is important, stress is important, where you live is important. Um, there are a lot of factors that contribute to whether or not you have heart disease or not. And so we can't just isolate one variable. We have to deal with all those variables because the world is actually messy. And the nature of learning is such that it is a messy thing too. There are a lot of factors that contribute, but if we collect enough data and do our research carefully, we can begin to tease out relationships. And that's what we did. So I'm gonna show you some tables. Um, so first of all, these are the 17 institutions. And uh, we had two different sampling strategies, but this is the, the, the data I'm gonna talk about today. Um, so we had roughly 12,000 people from around the world, um, a minimum of 500 for each of these 17 institutions. Um, and um, since they just changed your name, the Frost Museum of Science, which used to be the Miami Museum of Science, that's the that's um, So, okay, we had lots and lots of variables. Um, each of these domains, knowledge and understanding, interest and curiosity, out of school engagement, location, applications, and confidence in science, essentially science identity. Um, we had, actually we had 13 variables measuring this, as, and as few as three measuring this. So we had lots of different ways of trying to slice this. And we did our, you know, good statistical analysis. All of these held together as constructs. And so what I'm showing you is the construct, basically, of these questions. So these are not just a single question, these are all multiple questions which collectively give some confidence in the results. Um, the bottom line is that if we look, and I'm just gonna show you two data tables. You know, if we look at youth, um, 
if we look at the number of visits, um, the more you visit, the greater the significance is. Um, and you can see that even one visit uh, makes a difference, but not much. But not much across many of these variables. Where you get a big bump is after two to four visits. I'll come back to that. Um, and then, um, interestingly enough, for some of these variables, if you have more than four visits, those numbers start to go down. <laughs> or in other cases, they start to level up. Um, I'll come back to that point also. Um, so that's one example of youth. Here's one example of adult data. This is how, um, this is how recently you visited. So never visited. So um, before 2010, uh, a couple years ago, a year ago, one year, within the last year. Obviously, the more recently people visit, the more, the, the greater the significance again. And what these funny little numbers, this ETA thing on the side is, that's called effect sizes. And so something may be statistically significant, but actually may have a very low effect size, which means that it is significant. But that might just be because we've got such a big sample. And, you know, maybe, maybe that's not much of an effect. So just to help you decode that, an effect size of below 0.1 um, is probably no effect at all. Um, an effect size of over 0.1 is on the low end, but probably still means something. An effect size of 0.2 means that it's basically, that's what you'd expect. That's about average. That's a typical effect size. Anything. And if it's over 0.3, which none of these are, I don't believe, um, then it's serious, serious effect, big time. Um, we can really depend on it. But most of the effect sizes we we saw in this data were between 0.1 and 0.3. They were in that sort of, yeah, sort of on the low end to moderate, uh, what you'd expect. So um, here's the big conclusion. So <laughs> here's where the research <laughs> Two slides I'm going to give you the end. What we found out. The first thing is that for both youth and adults, youth and adults who use science centers are significantly more likely than those who don't to have high levels of knowledge and understanding of science, interest and curiosity in science and technology, engagement with an interest in science as a school subject. That was just the youth. So we talked to ask all these youth, you know, uh, what is the subject that you're interested in? It was those who um, visited science centers particularly frequently were significantly more likely to say science. They were not significantly more likely to say art or history or math, which is actually a good thing. You know, basically, um, what it says is this wasn't a, a function of the population. It wasn't just that those kids who were privileged enough to go to science centers are likely to do well in everything, which we might assume. But good news is if you actually go to a science center, you do like science. Um, and the more often you go, the more likely you are. Um, they're more likely to engage with science and technology related activities out of school, hobbies, and vocations, and they're more likely to pursue careers and have confidence in themselves as a science subject. That's all pretty good. Um, furthermore, the results were strong for both youth and adults, but um, almost uniformly, the um, the effect sizes were larger for adults than they were for youth, which was an interesting finding. Um, in general, it makes sense, but it's nice to have it reinforced that the more frequently you go, the more recently you go, the more likely to have an effect. Here's another thing that, but for me, I was really interested in this, these last two points. Um, and I will digress and tell you a little bit. Um, so many, many years ago, when I was um, 19 years old, uh, working my way through college at Berkeley, um, I had the honor of having a great job. I was a lecture demonstrator at the Lawrence Hall of Science right after it opened. Okay? And ma imagine this was um, 1970, so you kind of think of $1970. I was getting paid $50 a lecture, $50 an hour. Um, in 1970. Now I actually wrote the lectures and you know, there was there was some front end work. But basically I waltzed in and um, 
you know, did five of these a week for an hour. And I was uh, living high on the hog. <laughs> um, I was doing great. And, you know, I, I was, uh, remember how I was doing a pretty good job with my crowd. Um, and then the director, I, I got word that uh, there was a new policy at Lawrence Hall Science, and they were going to um, change direction. And rather than invest their dollars in these short, one-shot field trip things, they were going to invest in more intensive programs. Um, and being precocious, as I was then, um, I made an appointment to see the director, who was a noted physicist. Um, and I said, Professor Portis, I understand completely you know, your assumption that um, if you put in more time, you will get better results in terms of, you know, spending more hours with kids should result in more significant learning for these kids. Makes perfect sense. But do you know what the shape of the curve is? What's the slope? Um, you know, is it a linear thing? So that if we spend one hour, we get this much going on, and if we spend two hours, we get twice as much. If we spend three hours, we get three times as much. If we spend four hours, we get four times as much. Or is it, you know, exponential? Right? For each hour, we, you know, get a geometric increase. Or is it, you know, is, it, is there an asymptote? So maybe, actually, you get most of your bang for the buck in the first hour. Do you know what the slope of the curve is? I mean, how are you spending your money here? And, you know, so he's an experimental physicist. He said, John, that's really interesting. Uh, you know, you're not going to get your job back, but I'll think about it. <laughs> um, and I'm here to tell you that 40 years later, um, as a community, we still don't have the answer to that question. Um, this data begins to suggest that there is a threshold phenomenon. And that basically, um, and I was committed to trying to find this out, <laughs> um, that actually you by and large see in the data a, uh, a, a significant increase from zero to two to four visits, and then it flattens out after that. And likewise, um, in terms of duration, you see an increase up to four hours, but then it flattens out. In fact, in terms of hour duration, after five hours, it starts to decrease in terms of effect. So that's good information. That's the kind of information that we can actually use to make our programs better. And it tells us how we should invest our dollars. So um, that's great. That's a science center. But what about this whole thing in general? So I also collected some data in Los Angeles. Um, again, random telephone survey, about 1,000 people. I'll sort of zip through this. Um, I looked, I was trying to see, so let's, let's assume that there are four big contributors, I'll say five big contributors, to adult science literacy. Public understanding of science. Um, schooling, <coughs> childhood experiences outside of school, adult experiences outside of school, experiences in the workplace, and privilege. Maybe it doesn't matter what you're you get at, if you're white, if you're affluent, if you're male, um, life's good. <laughs> um, and as it turns out, um, I collected, I asked people lots and lots of questions. Uh, this is just a sampling of some. There are lots of things that were highly significant contributors to public understanding of science, including books, magazines, and newspapers read out of school, in the mail, um, using the internet, income, um, highest level of education completed, uh, work on job, childhood reading of books and magazines, um, again, an occupational one. So all, lots of factors. But when we looked at these as in terms of those five big factors, so we summed up all, created a model again, so what are all the factors that are related to schooling? What are all the factors that are related to childhood experiences as adults? <coughs> um, what we find is that to begin with, um, collectively, these explain over 50% of the variance, which anybody who knows social science, that's pretty damn good. Okay? So collectively, these are the things that actually contribute to public understanding of science. Um, years of schooling contributed 17% of the variance. Childhood, out of school experiences contribute the exact same amount, 17% of the variance. Workplace, 20% of the variance. Privilege, 
23% of the variance. Helps to be male, helps to be affluent, helps to be white. Out of school adult experiences, free choice experiences, 39% of the variance. Okay? So, what we can conclude from that is all of these are highly significant. All of these are important. But you certainly can't say that schooling is the most important thing. Um, you and as I provocatively talk about, um, and my apologies to all my school colleagues who might be in this room, <laughs> um, currently in the US, at the federal, state, and local level, we invest 99 cents on every dollar that we spend on education in this country on schools. Schools do not contribute 99% of the value. So as a society, we are not investing in many things that make a significant difference, have a significant impact on public understanding of science, despite the fact that they think we're doing a good job, trying to do a good job. Um, I would certainly argue that this provides some evidence that we might want to think about how we invest our dollars. In fact, in general, although all of this research, again, is correlation, it doesn't exactly prove, it doesn't causally prove that having a science center or all these experiences creates a more literate public. There is an increasing amount of evidence that suggests, actually, when you start collecting this kind of data from lots of different places and lots of different ways, and you keep getting the same results, and it probably means there's something going on there. And my conclusion is, you know, people talk, well, is it because um, people who are predisposed to be interested in science go to science centers, that's why they're more, um, you know, do better. And I say, you know, this is a chicken and egg story. So let me put it in a, in a barnyard context. <laughs> You're a farmer. You can't decide whether you started having eggs because you had hens, or because you had hens, you started having eggs, you know, or you got some eggs and then you had hens, but you know you need to sell eggs. And having hens in the barnyard results in a lot of eggs. And so if you're making money off of eggs, then you probably want to have hens in your barnyard. And if you want to have a society where you value those kinds of outcomes, then it behooves you to have places like science centers and science museums, and this museum, zoos, aquariums, and all these other places, because the evidence is overwhelming that communities that have these are significantly more likely to have those kinds of outcomes. And citizens who use them are significantly more likely to have those outcomes. So if I am a policymaker and I want to have those outcomes, well, I don't know whether it's chicken and egg, but it certainly makes sense to have hands in the barnyard. <laughs> um, I think that you know we can point to data, and I have data. Uh, I do have some data that is more causal. Uh, we have causal studies. We have studies that are comparably causal to what schools have, that if you teach X, for a year, and then you give a test, kids seem to know that. We have a lot of data like that, which somehow isn't as valid when we do it in the informal sector, that when people go to a science center, and that there's an exhibit on X, people come out knowing about X. We've got lots of data that is just as valid as the standardized tests. Um, they're all self-referential, but so is the school's data, self-referential. What this suggests is that Overall, you need all of these things to create an ecosystem of learning. So we need to start functioning as if this is a complex science learning, music learning, history learning, art learning, civics learning, you name it, community. We need to look at the whole, not the pieces. So, trying to put my money where my mouth is, I have funding, generous amount of funding, um, to try and see if we can't take what we've learned from all this and do something important within a single community as an experiment. And this project is called Synergies, and it's purposefully named that because what Synergies is is where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, right? So our framing assumptions, which should sound familiar from all the data that I just provided you, is that people learn science across their lifetime from many different sources, and that disproportionately people learn based on their own needs and interests, right? And that since learning is this never-ending cumulative process coming from many different sources, 
It makes sense that the only way we're going to make a significant difference is if we all work together collaboratively within a community. So we have defined the system, the public education system of this one community in Oregon as the whole community. It isn't, the system isn't the school system. The system is all the people who live in this community. That's the system. And therefore, the contributors to public education are all the people who live in this community. And therefore, they're all teachers, they're all learners. We have to work collectively to make this a difference. So, what we've been doing, and I apologize for the fine print here, um, we're specifically focusing on school age kids. We, are, we work with a cohort of kids um, started every 10-year-old child who lived within this geographic boundary, whether they were in public school, or private school, or home school. We started trying to track them, starting when they were 10, roughly in fifth grade, and we were going to track them and collect data on them for the next five years. And meanwhile, we are trying to organize, and we're collecting data in lots of different ways. We're even modeling it with a computer simulation, doing aging-based modeling, trying to focus on interest and engagement with experiences. And our partners are every bloody organization and individual who we can convince to work with us. So currently our partners and the Synergies Project are public and private schools in this district. Um, the libraries, um, the Science Center, the Children's Museum, the Zoo, um, the Park District, um, about a half a dozen different kinds of after-school providers, including 4-H and Mesa, as well as the social service after-school provider. Um, the faith-based, a number of faith-based organizations, um, the uh, community college, um, two universities. Um, I'm sure I'm leaving some folks out, but you know, basically, we're trying to find anybody who's willing to work with us is, can be our partner. And key to this partnership, I've been telling people, is we're not saying, we're saying all of you are working really hard. You're all doing the best you possibly can. We're not going to ask you to change your goals. Your goals are what your goals are. All we're asking you is to buy into the idea that there are other people in this community who share some part of your goal. And if you work together, you're more likely to both achieve your goals. So we will help broker those overlaps and maybe even foster some other overlaps that you didn't realize. And so we're going to build synergies. Um, just to give you a sense of this community, um, it, for historical reasons, it has its own school district, which makes it easy. Four elementary schools feed into one middle school and feed into one high school. Um, it's low income, very diverse community, academically low, achieving all four of the elementary schools fail, there no child left behind. So bad in school. Um, actually, at the middle school, um, and you know, you just bite your tongue. Um, all the science, there are no labs, there's no hands on at the middle school on any science instruction, it's all textbook and lecture. Um, but, you know, we're not telling them what they should do. We're just saying, whatever, however you're doing it, we can help you be more effective. Um, it's very diverse racially and ethnically, and the asterisk here is although it's 40% white, 60% um, of those individuals are um, uh, recent immigrants from primarily Eastern Europe. Um, there are, and then sort of got blocked off here, there are 45 acknowledged languages within the school district, uh, but over 100. So it's a relatively small, you know, the whole district is about 1,500 students. 45 acknowledged languages. <laughs> our, our questionnaires um, and parent permission stuff um, was translated into Spanish, Chinese, Vietnamese, um, Ukrainian, and Russian. Um, so, at any rate, uh, and what our data over the last couple of years, and we spent the first year of the project just talking to people, 
just stakeholding. We spent the next two we've spent the next two years collecting baseline data because if we're going to make a change in the community, we need to know what the community is like to begin with. Um, so we've been tracking these kids um, every year with quantitative data. We've got case study kids that we we talk to every month. Um, as I say, we've been modeling it, and now we're starting to build coalitions. We're bringing all these people together and helping them create an education plan for their community, but it's based on data. So based on the data, we have identified three key um, leverage points where we can see that if these, are, these conditions are not met, we're going to see this precipitous drop off. Um, first of all, this synergies thing, which is obviously key. So I'll give you a, another little one here. And then by my time. Um, at least by my by my watch. <laughs> um, so uh, you know, we tend to think of informal is the place where kids get excited, school is the stuff where they learn the content, right? Um, actually, I would argue that it, typically it's the other way around. Um, actually, most people learn most of their in-depth information outside of school because school is sort of this low life -ish. It's only if you go to graduate school that you actually get into the depth of stuff. And case in point, you know, we were, track, we were tracking these, the interest trajectories of these kids. And all of a sudden we got this huge bump in uh, astronomy-related interest. And it turns out that the schools had a unit on astronomy. And at first we thought, we knew that one of the teachers was a um, astronomy buff, you know, hobbyist. And we figured it's probably just this one teacher. But in fact, no, it wasn't just one teacher. It was across all three middle school teachers where we got this month. It was the last unit that was taught in the spring, sixth grade spring unit. Um, by fall, that was all gone. But that's because whose job was it to help kids know, you know, it's now summer vacation. The local community college has planetary. The local science center has um, astronomy programs. There's an amateur astronomy club in your neighborhood that has workshops and scholarships for kids. But how were those kids to know that that was the case? <coughs> nobody told them. It was nobody's responsibility. The teacher did his job or her job. They taught the lesson and I guess they taught it well because kids thought, got excited. But by the time kids went back to school, they weren't excited about astronomy anymore because nothing happened in between. So our message to this community is we've gathered together all the players is to say, who's the grown-ups here? Whose job is this? You know, we're not telling you, the school teacher, that you need to do something in the summer, but yeah, we are telling you that you should at least tell your kids if you are having fun with this, you know, there are these resources out there. And we should be communicating to those resources that we're teaching this class in school now, this lesson, this topic, and you might want to get in touch with the kids. We'll help you. Meanwhile, you know, kids do stuff after school. They get excited, but the teacher has no idea what they're doing after school. And the after-school person has no idea what they're doing at home. So it's only if we all talk to each other can we actually help each other be better at what we do. Kids need role models. They need support because they get encouraged, but they need to know what they do with this. So it's not, there are lots of mentoring programs. This is not about big brother, big sister. It's not just about having a meaningful adult in your life. That's a good thing. But it's having somebody who shares your interest and passion. So if you are interested in astronomy, let's match you with somebody who actually is also interested and knows something about and passionate about astronomy. Because then the person is better able to guide you into other additional things you can do. I mean, if you just have another adult, they may or may not know anything about what the resources are, how they help you get passionate about astronomy. So it's not that we're trying to make every kid an astronomer. It's we want to make every kid engaged and passionate about some area of science. So let's figure out a way to build those mentorships. And then finally, we all say, yeah, we know that adolescents, we're dealing now with adolescents, are really influenced by their peers, and son of a gun, our data supports that. We have kids 
who were doing things, who dropped out of activities because they had no friends in them. But how many educators, in school or out of school, actually pay attention to that reality, who spend as much time supporting peer relationships as they do contact? If you want those kids to stay engaged, you have to make sure they have friends who are doing things with them, and then they'll stay engaged. So you need to devote as much time and energy to building cool ways for kids to meet other kids or reinforce that this is a good thing to do with your friends if you want them to stay engaged. So we've argued that these are key leverage points, and we've created committees within the community to figure out how to tackle each of those problems to help us Again, we're not telling you what to do. We're just telling you how to make, accomplish what you want to accomplish. Here are some leverage points. As a community, figure it out, and we will play broker. We'll be happy to be that neutral, honest broker who can convene you, will provide food and drink if you want, and we'll just make sure you have meetings and do that, but we aren't going to tell you what to do. And so that's what we're trying to do within this community, which ultimately is this, again, trying to make this a functional ecosystem. It is a secret system. It's just not always a very functional ecosystem. And so, as we talked about at lunch today, there's an opportunity here in New Mexico to actually forge a functional ecosystem. But it takes work, it takes effort, and it takes um, some kind of higher level goals. It, Collaborations don't just happen because you say it's a good idea to collaborate. We're all busy. So you need to feel that this collaboration will help you solve your problem. And so what, that's what we're trying to do in this one community, in uh, sub-community in Portland, is try and help people in that community solve their problem by being a, a good broker and giving them the tools to do that. So anyway, that's all I have to say. Um, if you want to follow up on any of this, you know, there's how you get in touch with me. And I will now entertain your <laughs> <laughs>